Welcome back to Whitetail Cribs. This week, we are headed to Ohio to see the largest unicorn buck ever documented. It's a 265 inch buck shot by Dave Kopp in 2016. And beyond that, you get to check out giant elk, giant deer, and check out his Southern Ohio hunting cabin. Here we go. I'm Dave Kopp, and this is my hunting cabin in Southeastern Ohio. I guess I'll talk about the, the three elk first because I'm probably one of the luckiest people that you'll ever meet. <laughs> I drew tags for New Mexico for elk uh, three years in a row. That was my first elk. Shot him on the very last day, the 10th day of our hunt. And I, you know, eight to 12 miles a day in the mountains in New Mexico. And I was just gone. I was done <laughs> and so exhausted. and. You know, it was a guided service, and they helped me tremendously. So he called that elk in for me and gave me a 31-yard shot, and uh, he went down 20 minutes later, and, and I was hooked for life. So I love whitetail hunting, but, you know, my new passion, honestly, is elk hunting. Um, so, and then uh, the next year, Damien and I, without a guide, uh, Damien Riffle um, helped me shoot this beaut, my biggest bull, uh, and he's uh, around 320. He came in after a uh, cow in the rut, and it was probably one of the most exhilarating experiences I've ever had. I told Damien, I said, you need to come to my deathbed when I'm on my way out, and we gotta relive that story because unbelievable. Um, and then last year, I was fortunate enough to get this one. He's 12 and a half years old. They had history with him. Uh, they called him Curly. He's around 310. That hunt, I mean, <laughs> it was an hour and a half standoff. And we were with the herd, with the cows. Unbelievable experience. I, I just, I had to stay still. My guide was right, was right with me, behind me, and I didn't get a shot till, you know, he just kept going behind brush and junipers, and it was just, he just wasn't coming out. Um, so finally I got a shot, and we recovered him the next morning. Um, and then, so I, and last year, I'll, I'll talk about my 10-point. So I guess I'm going to say Damien's name way too much because he's one of my best friends and probably one of the best hunters I know. So there's this moon phase they talk about in October, two days prior to the new moon, two days after the new moon in October. If you can be out there during that time, I'd highly suggest it. That, that deer never showed maybe four or five times throughout this whole spring and summer in last light. And he showed up, it was the second day after the new moon in October, and he showed up at 4.30. And I, I just was beside myself. And uh, he scores 171. This one uh, was in the first year I bought the property in 2017. Ed Waite by Buckmaster scored him at 167 as an eight point, although he does have some junk, um, you know, coming out of his forehead. It's, I, it's interesting how a few of my deer have that junk in the in the center there. So this one was uh, 2020. I did shoot him with a compound bow. Honestly, I've only killed a couple with the compound bow. Most have been the crossbow. The giant was a crossbow. So I'm working towards it. I just, I started hunting in 2009 and, you know, practice, practice, practice. So one day I'll get there. Just, uh, you know, a work in progress, I guess. So what, we can go upstairs and I can show you a couple more and then we can get a better view of the big one. So this is my loft up here. This one was 2018 and nice little buck, probably three and a half. Probably should let him go. <laughs> I couldn't though, he's just beautiful. Um, I get way too excited. I've got one back here. This was 2014 with a compound bow. Uh, with a drop tine, just very unique. I had never seen a drop tine, and, and so he went down. And, uh, and the mount that I had uh, Eric Turkovich do it um, out of uh, Ashland, Ohio, and he just did a beautiful job on that mount. Okay, so now the story on this one. <laughs> <laughs> My father-in-law owns a smaller farm in Alliance, Ohio, 46 acres. In the spring of 2015, I found some sheds. I went to him with these sheds and I never found any real decent sheds. And these were 150, 60 class sheds. 
both of them within 15 yards of each other. And, and uh, I said, please, I said, this, this buck is gonna be a giant next year. Can I hunt, you know, this coming year? And he was adamant and said, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so it became September of that year and uh, 2015. And there was a rub on a tree that was at least eight inches in diameter. And I took him out in his side by side to show him that rub and it was just shredded. And I said, it has to be that buck, it has to be. Once again, I asked him, you know, did I hunt? No. <laughs> and then it was about a week later and I get, I call it the email of all emails. In the email, he said, Dave, if you hunt only that buck, no does, just that big one, you can hunt out here. So I was ecstatic. You know, I went out, I was very careful. I know the property well, um, there's a funnel, you know, and, and he actually feeds them up by, you know, they plant soy and corn, um, 15 acres of his property. And then he puts um, a camera and a, always a, a trophy rock um, and then some corn out for pictures. I was trying to think of anything and everything uh, to hunt that buck. Very careful with scent control. I, I became very meticulous. And then after the rut, I, I just, it was over. You know, I, only, I probably was out there four or five times, uh, maybe six times during the rut uh, because of the wind, you know, um, making sure that was right. And I had given up. I, I, and I said to one of my best friends, Brian Coons, I said, I just, I can't believe it's over. You know, that's how I felt. So I continue hunting and I always harvest a couple does. My family loves venison. Um, harvest a couple does and I'm down in Salt Fork and this would be uh, January 24th. The season ends February 7th. So January 4th, I, it was a Sunday. I come home to my computer and I look at the email and my father-in-law had sent me a picture of this giant. And I looked at it and I said, I had never seen anything like that. I, I couldn't even count the points. <laughs> he said, all it said was, Dave, I think this is the big one. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I think so too. So, you know, I, I put a plan into measure. I, I immediately thought to myself, you know, I, I've got to attract this deer. What do deer really love? It's white acorns. So I get online that night and I ordered white acorn powder from Vermont. It didn't come till Thursday, but I, and I went out and I, I on Wednesday, the wind was right. Um, it had to be a Northwest wind. I climbed up into a, a pin oak tree and you know, it's late, late January, you know, nothing on the trees. And I was like, sticking out like a sore thumb. I, I stood sideways with my crossbow. Two does came in, um, a mother and a, and a yearling. The yearling came right up to the tree and sniffed the tree and the mother was fine. Um, and they, they took off and, and uh, then I climbed down and sprayed the tree down and walked out, sprayed my path. I was just very, very meticulous. And so that was Wednesday. Thursday, the white acorn powder comes. I go back out. I put some of that with the corn where he feeds them. And he was getting pictures every every night of this deer. This deer was, I believe, uh, emaciated from the rut. You know, you think about it, he didn't have to fight whatsoever. And he was pretty run down and he was hungry, you know, trying to uh, recover. That was on a Thursday and the wind wasn't gonna be right the whole weekend. I was very disappointed and then it came to be I believe it was, well, I know it was February 1st and I'm almost positive it was Monday. So before that, I'll back up a little bit. I had never hunted out of a blind, always in trees, always in climbers, always in you know ladder stands, hang-ons, loved hang-ons, still love hang-ons. So my one buddy said, you know, you've got this lake here. We can use that so that deer can't come behind you and we'll put the blind up right against this lake. And then where the uh, funnel is, where they come out and then head towards his feed, it was just a perfect spot, you know, 25 yards from the brush where the funnel, you know, where they came out of that funnel. And and I had watched him numerous times through his spotting scope in the family room, just, you know, take that path. So yeah, we set the blind up, brushed it in real nice. And that was on Thursday and I didn't have the right wind until February 1st. I go out uh, about 2.30, I get there and we decide for my father-in-law to take me um, in the side-by-side -side because that's when, you know, when he goes out and feeds the deer, um, you know, he's, he uses the side-by-side, -side, same familiar noise, and we knew he wasn't far. He drops me off. I, on the way, kind of a funny story is, you know, I was so, like, I was doing stuff, like, just remember uh, how 
like amped I was to just, you know, just every, every detail. I even took charcoal capsules, you know, to help eliminate some scent. You know, I was spraying everything down meticulously, washing everything meticulously. Um, so on the way to the blind, I said to him, do you think I should duck down? Because it's always just you driving this side by side. Maybe he'll figure something is wrong. <laughs> And he looked at me and said, do you really think they can effing count? <laughs> and I just started dying laughing. And, and uh, so that's one of the funnier stories. Um, so he drops me off. I get in the blind. It's like 3 o'clock. You know, the um, last light is, so sun down was like 541. Last shooting light was 611. So I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there. And it was the new moon. I didn't realize any, I knew none of that stuff. Um, and it was getting dark. And I had the screen up in the blind, you know, that little camo screen. And so, and it had been out since Thursday and he had seen it. Anyway, I'm, I'm sitting there and, you know, nothing, nothing. I didn't even see any does. Like, I, it was horrible. Like, I, and then finally it had to have been around six o'clock. It was getting dark and it was getting dark fast. And I could not see through that screen because it was getting so, so I take the screen down. So I don't know, it was 6.05 maybe, but it was definitely getting dark. And I, I'm looking to the left and, and to the right, I, my peripheral vision catches movement. And you know, he's 60, 80 yards out moving this way. And I couldn't tell it was him. I just see the large mass and, you know, and then he's coming behind all the thick stuff. And then the, the little path he comes out of all the brush and um, where they all come out at, uh, he stops before that. And I still, like, I'm thinking that's got to be him. I wasn't positive. And then finally when he came up and then he just freaking stood right there and was staring right at my blind, like just locked on my blind and wasn't moving straight on. There was no shot. I'm thinking to myself, oh, God. And, I, and, I, and honestly, I would have missed with a compound blow. I was shaking so bad. And I was able to put my elbow on my um, knee to uh, brace myself. And I just, I was still shaking. And um, I think why he was staring at the blind was because I had taken that screen out and it was something different. And then instead of going to his left towards the food, like to the right, I got no shot. It's all this thick briar brush stuff and there's no shot. And so he turns to the right. And right as he turns, I knew that was my only opportunity. As he was turning, I just put it right behind his shoulder and shot. I heard him do the 180 and just fly, you know, through the, branches breaking, but I never heard him crash. And I'm like, you're kidding me, you know? I, I really believed it was a good shot. I waited, you know, and they talk about waiting the hour, and I just, it was like the longest hour of my life. You know? And so I get out and I'm looking for the knock for the arrow, and, and uh, I couldn't find it. I went back into his house, and all I said was, I think I got him, I think I got him. And he goes, no, you didn't, no, you didn't get him. So anyway, he goes, well, let's go look, and he gets, uh, gets ready, we get in his ranger, and he drops me off where, you know, the area I had shot him, and I figured, oh, just last place I heard him was like 20 yards in, Was I heard the, so I just walk in like 20 yards, and there he was, freaking late, he only ran 20 yards. I just couldn't believe it, I, I mean, I hit my knees, uh, and just, I had never seen anything like that, you know? I had no, I had no idea the deer got that big. And then my father-in-law, because he couldn't walk the greatest, so he's in the side-by-side, -side, just comes crashing through all the brush. I mean, all these little sapling trees, you know, and he's pretty particular about that side-by-side. -side. He gets out and he says, wow, I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> I called him, uh, Brian, my, my friend, to, uh, come help me, get him out. And he came that evening, he was working, he came around nine. And we, you know, cause it was so late in the season, we were worried about the rack, you know, the rack falling off. And we, I mean, I was so careful. I, I put um, a, a strap under his neck as we carried him out. Um, when I load him in the back of the truck, I have a picture of that somewhere where the, we put a pillow down. Drove around, showed him to a couple friends. Um, I remember driving, we, I, I couldn't sleep that night. Drove to IHOP, we, it was like two in the morning, I think. Backed him in so we could just sit there and look out at the truck, you know. <laughs> the next morning, I, I had made a friend uh, that was a farmer and his daughter was a photographer. And I wanted to show him the buck anyway, so I drove to his house and he called her and, and uh, she was able to take some really nice photos of him, which was cool. Because I wouldn't have thought, I mean, you know, I, I wasn't into all that. So we were able to get some really good photos of him. It's just, you know, and I, and I had him scored. 
Boone and Crockett scored him and went through that whole process. The bottom line is he ended up after the whole awards ceremony in Springfield, Missouri. They do that once every three years. And he went out there. I had to ship him out there. Um, and they dropped him to 258. Um, his net gross is 273 and two eights. Uh, by Ed Waite from Buckmasters, and that's the score I prefer, honestly. I, it, it was just that it was back and forth so many times, and it was it was just frustrating, so. But it is what it is, he's over 250, right? He's a mega giant. <laughs> um, so I sold the original to Keith Snyder, who has done an episode of this, obviously, with his <laughs> unbelievable collection. And I'm happy I did. You know, he's probably one of the best guys in the industry, and then I know he'll be seen by, you know, others to be really appreciated. Um, so a part of that deal, um, Keith had just acquired the General. He had bought that back from Bass Pro Shops, and so he had Klaus, who has done all my replicas, and I knew he was the best. So I bought, I have the first replica from Klaus off of Keith, of the general. When we were there, there was one other deer that really blew me away, and it was the Illinois roadkill. So I had to buy that one. And so there the three giants are. What an experience. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Whitetail Cribs. And if you want to support what we're doing here, head over to our website, exodusoutdoorgear.com. Check out our Exodus render. It is an incredible reliable cell camera for this upcoming season backed by a five-year no bs warranty and also we just launched a new line of exodus mmt tailored arrows you can go over there put the inputs of what you're shooting and you'll get tailored made arrows shipped to your door we still have a little bit of time here for the october one opener so be sure to head over and check that out until next sunday see ya